Hey everyone, welcome back to our series on building a screencasting app in Vue.js. So today we're going to be diving into a topic that is more complex than a lot of the topics we've been looking at. And it's not that any part of it is complex, but there are just a lot of things and you have to get them all working together in order for the feature to work. I'm talking about user authentication and most apps you're going to build need this. So it's important to get right. Authentication is complex and has a lot of moving parts. So we're going to take this step by step. So the first step will be setting the current user. And there will be three mini steps on that. First, it'll be displaying a list of users, then clicking on one of them to set it as the current user, and then saving that current user in local storage. Then we'll actually get our login screen. And in that login screen, so first we'll do the basic flow of it. Just enter our username and password and be able to log in. Then we'll make it so you can hide and show the password. And then we'll add validations. So we'll start with a very basic flow and then make it a little bit nicer for our user. Finally, we'll do the registration flow. And so the first step is going to be to abstract the form that we used in the login flow and to turn it into a component that we can reuse. Then we'll reuse that component in the registration flow. And finally, we'll do some cleanup to make our code and our app a little bit nicer. Now, if you've built an authentication system before, there's some things that you may expect to be in this list that are missing. Uh, don't worry, we're going to get to those in future videos. Specifically, I'm talking about token authentication and authorization in general. There's a lot to do today, so let's get started. The goal for having a login and registration form is to have a current user and for them to be able to sign in. So let's start with just doing that without doing all the forms. So by the end of this section, you'll be able to click one of these buttons and log yourself in and actually log in as other people because we're not doing authentication yet. We're just getting the basics ready. And we'll also be able to reload and still be logged in. Then we hit log out and we are back to not having a current user. Once we're done with this, then we'll be able to have the login and registration forms that'll do it in a slightly more secure way. We'll start by creating a route to list our users in. And since we're listing all the users, we'll go ahead and put it in the admin path. So let's start creating that component. So what we're gonna be wanting to do here is loop through a bunch of users. And so to make this work, we have to get the users from somewhere. I've already set up the server to send back an array of users if we call API slash users. And each of those users has an ID, name, and email. So let's go ahead and use an established pattern to get those users. So first we're gonna be mapping from the state. And that presumes that we have something in the state, which we will be putting there very soon. And we'll call this users. All right, and so how do we get that into the state? Well, we're gonna call a method, well, an action on the store. And we're gonna call that when this component is mounted. So when it's mounted, we'll call this dot store dot dispatch and we'll call load users. You'll notice that this is similar to how we called load videos in the app component. That's because this is the same loading pattern. We're just localizing it to the admin user list. All right, so now let's go ahead and go to our store. And so 
we're going to have a users array. That's what we're going to be filling up on the load. And then we're going to be having a set users mutation. And this will follow a very familiar pattern. And then we'll go ahead and call that mutation from a load users method. And so this will not be quite as complex as our load videos because there's not as much processing we need to do. However, a lot of it will be similar. So, well, the basics of it will be similar. So we'll be calling api.get to users. We'll be getting a response and we will also be getting that from response.data.data. And this will get us our actual array of users. And then we can map the attributes like we do here. The difference being we'll be doing it on users instead of videos. And then we'll call set users instead of set videos. And here you'll see that we indeed have the list of names and it corresponds with the names from our users API. So we've loaded our users and then we've mutated the state to put those users on the users array. And then here we're mapping the state and using them in a V4. Now what we want to do is expand this v4 so each of these will have a button that we can click to log them in. Then we'll want the current user's name to show up in our app bar. Now there are multiple ways we could tackle this but I always like to get fast feedback first and so we're going to go ahead and start by putting a current user in the state and showing it in our app.view. So let's go to the store and we will put in a current user and all we'll want is a name for now. In our app.view, we'll be importing map state and then using that to create a computed property for the current user. Then before our login text, let's go ahead and use our current user right there. And when we go here, we'll see that the name of test user is correctly displayed. Now, if we have a user logged in, we probably don't want to show the login button. So let's go ahead and use a v if to fix that. So v if uh, current user dot name. So if there's a name to display, then we'll display that. Otherwise, we'll, in a v else, display the login button. And as you can see, it's just showing the user. But we'll want a way to log out. So let's go ahead and add a logout button there. So we'll make it a v button with a text and the same class as the login and we'll just say log out. And that's looking good. Now it's time to make the login and log out buttons work. And it's always easier to destroy. So let's tackle the log out button. In the log out button, we will set up a click event handler and we'll send the log out user method. So create our method and it's just going to dispatch to the store. Our goal with this action is to turn the current user from this into this. So we'll work our way back and we have our logout user mutation and it's fairly easy for now. So we'll have state.currentUser is equal to this. And as we're doing more with the login and logout, this will get more complex, but 
we're starting off with the simple stuff. All right, and then we will go ahead and add a new logout user action down here, and it will also be very simple. Let's test this out. We hit the logout button, and then our current user is no more. Now that we know how to log out and set the current user to an empty object, let's go ahead and create our login buttons here so we can log in different users. We'll start backwards from our store. So our default will once again be an empty hash and then we will have a mutation which is set current user and it'll just take a state and a user and it will set the current user to the user. All right, so it's sort of the inverse of this. And then we will have our action of login user. And it will also take a user and it'll just commit the set current user mutation and feed it the user. This is easy enough so far. And then in the admin user list, we will create a button and we'll make them small and then on our click, we will have a login user method and we'll send in the user. And then we will have to have a method for this. And this will just dispatch to the store. If we go to our browser, we'll see that we have the login buttons and it correctly logs us in whenever we click them. This is great, but we do want to keep that current user around. We don't want to have to log them in every time we reload the page. So for that, we'll go to our old friend, Local Storage. Because of the layout of UX, we only need to go to the store file and edit stuff there in order to add this capability and mostly we'll be messing with these two mutations, logout user and set current user. So in set current user, we'll be setting window.localstorage. Uh, we'll call it current user, might as well. And remember, we'll have to stringify our user, but otherwise, that's all we need to do. And then we'll do something similar in logout user. And so now when we go here and we log someone in, we can go and check to see that it was put into our local storage. And yep, we have the entire current user in local storage. But if we reload the page, even though our current user is in local storage, it's not getting set as the current user in the app. So let's make sure that happens. We'll do that in our load users action. So after we set the users, we will commit set current user. And we'll be getting our uh, user from window.localstorage.current user. And of course, we will have to use json.parse on this. because in local storage, it's a string, but this, our mutation will want an object. All right, now, there we go. We reload and they're still logged in. We log out, they're logged out, reload, still logged out. Awesome. So we have one part of our login and logout system. Some of it, like this list and the login buttons that let you be anyone you want, uh, these are going to go away. But this app bar and what we did in the store are going to be core parts of how our authentication system works. And we're going to be building around those core parts as we go on. In this section, we're gonna take our super simple and not very secure at all, 
login and logout system and put in a login form with a username and password. In order to do that, we're gonna need an API endpoint that will take an email and a password and it will return a user if the email and password match or it will return an error if they don't match. So we've created that API endpoint here. You don't have to understand this code in particular. This is Ruby on Rails code that we're using. Uh, but whatever backend you're using, make sure that at API slash sessions, it can take a post and then return either a user or an error. Now let's start on our front end code. We'll start with making a login page. In our user login, we're going to create a form and we're gonna go ahead and use everything we've learned from the past couple videos. So we'll have a vText field in here and our V model for this one. So this will be our email and then we'll have one for our password. So let's go ahead and put in some data and this will be our login info. And it'll start off just being an empty hash or let's go ahead and put a blank email and a blank password in there. So this one will be our uh, login info dot email and this one will be our login info dot password and then we'll go ahead and put a label on each and see how they show up so we'll go to our login page and all right so they're both showing up decently We'll go ahead and put a V container around this. Since this will be user facing, we want it to look a little bit nicer than our admin pages. All right, and we'll need a V button that will submit. And we'll call it login. That's the text we're gonna have. Okay, our form is looking pretty good so far, uh, at least aesthetically we'll want this password to actually, uh, we'll want it to have those dots. And that's easy. We can just do type equals password. There we go. So we've got the basic outer form of it. Now let's get it hooked up. So we will attach the click event to login user, and that will be a method and We'll be accessing the login info and then we'll be sending that to an action on the store. And we'll call that action, appropriately enough, login user. And oh, hey, look, we already have an action called login user and it takes a user. Although this isn't actually a user now. This is now gonna be a lot more complicated because we're not taking in a user. We're taking in an email and a password. And we'll go ahead and call those collectively login info. And then we're gonna be calling to the server. And then only after that can we set the current user. So we'll need to make this async so we can talk to the server. So we will make our call and we'll bring in our API and then we'll post to sessions and we'll feed in the login info. And once again, for the purposes of making your stuff at home, this is what it should look like. All right, so you could do this, and that is just a slightly more complex version of this. But they do the exact same thing. 
All right, so we've got the response. And because this is JSON API, it's going to be dot data dot data dot attributes. And that's going to be getting our user. And from there, we can just commit set current user, assuming we got it all correct, right? Assuming it's turn returning the user and not a 401. So one way we can handle this is to do a try and catch block. So we'll put all of this in the try block. And then if there's an error, then instead of returning the user, we'll return an error. And we'll go ahead and give it a default message. Then in our login page, we'll need to get the user that's returned or the error. So we will call it the user. And then we will make sure this is using an await, a sync await. And then if user.error, we'll go ahead and display the user.error in an alert. Otherwise, we can, we don't really have anywhere else to put them yet. So we'll just go ahead and do an alert, say thank you for signing in. And we can go ahead and use their user. Uh, name, just to show that we really did get the user returned. So to review, we have the email and password attached to these two text fields. When we click this button, we're going to call the login user method. And then we're going to dispatch to the store. We're going to await what's happening from the store, and we'll get back an object. If there's an error on it, we'll show that error. Otherwise, we'll show an alert thanking them for signing in. Now, let's look at what's happening in the store. So we're going to try doing this. Uh, so calling out to the server and getting that response and then pulling the user attributes off of that and then committing those user attributes to the store. And then we're also going to have to return the user since we're uh, waiting a response from this method. And if at any point in here there's an error, then we're going to catch and return this error message. Now, uh, a little bit of an edge case. So 99% of the time, this will be the correct error message. But if there is like a network outage or a problem on our server, then we could encounter a failure for another reason besides the email and password combination being incorrect. And as we refine our app, that's something we're going to fix. But we're just doing the core case today. So anyways, this returns either a user or an error. And then like we saw before, it will send out an alert. Uh, so that's a basic pop up. And later on in this series, we'll be making that look much nicer. But for now, it's good to have that feedback. All right, so let's try this. We'll just make up something and hit login. And what a surprise, that email and password combination was incorrect. Okay, now we'll put in something that we know is a correct email address and still a gibberish password. Email password combination was incorrect. Now we will put in the correct password and then it thanks us for signing in. And we are signed in. What we have here is a working login page, but there's a lot that we would expect from a login page that we don't have yet. And so we're going to be adding two of those features. The first will be a button to the right here where it, when you click it, it can show the password and you click it again and it will hide the password. 
And so that'll make it a lot easier for people with complex passwords. And then we're going to be putting in validations. So to make sure the password is at least eight characters, to make sure this is a real email address. And uh, for most of that, we're going to be abstracting the validations that we've already created, but we will be creating a new one. All right, so let's get started. So we'll start with uh, making the password field a little bit nicer for those who have long, complex passwords they need to type out. So you'll notice if we have the type of password, then it'll show these dots. And if we have type of text, then it will show letters. So we need a way to switch between them. So we'll start with, uh, we'll have something called show or show password that's a little bit uh, more specific. And if that's true, then the type will be text. Otherwise, the type will be password. And we will need to put that colon in front for that to work. And so right now, the show is false. So it'll be showing password. But we can make show password true and now it will show it as letters. So now we know how to change how uh, it shows up either as text or as the dots. But we want the user to be able to do that as well. We'll start off with the simple ugly version. So this one will say show password or toggle password show and then when we click it will set show password equal to the opposite of what it was before and here we'll type in yep it works as expected but we want something that looks a little bit nicer fortunately Beautify has a nice little recipe on how to do that so this is really cool behavior. Notice how the eye icon changes. And in the source, we'll see that it's appending an icon and that icon changes depending on whether the show property is true or not. And then we'll click append. And so instead of clicking a button, then we're clicking the icon that's appended and doing the same action. The downside is that a pinned icon only works with uh, Vutify's built-in icons. Uh, so we have to work through Vutify. We can't use the icon uh, component that we created before. But that's okay, this is just a couple more steps. So we'll go to our uh, customization, we'll go to icons and here we'll learn how to add the MDI fonts. And MDI is the one that is added by default, but we don't actually import the dependencies by default. It's a little confusing. So we'll go ahead and add that. All right, and then we will copy paste this and put it in our plugins. Uh, Vutify.js. Excellent. And notice that the icon font is already set as MDI, even though uh, it didn't import the actual CSS. Hopefully that bug will be fixed in a future version. All right, so let's actually use this now. So we will have a pinned icon and we'll set this to MDI I as a start. All right, so we've got the I here, that's good. And then we will go ahead and make it so if show password is true, then we're putting in MDI I, otherwise, we're going to do MDI I off. And we'll make sure that's working. Good. 
Now we can get rid of this button. We will take this and we'll change it a little bit because we have to do click a pinned, but the other logic can stay the same. Excellent. All right, so we've tackled one really nice convenience feature, letting the user toggle whether they want to show their password or not. Now let's tackle validations. The last time we used validations was in the video edit form. And so it took this form. We had a rules array, which contained a set of rules. And those rules were defined in our data property. We're going to want to use some of these rules in our user login, specifically required and min length. So let's go ahead and abstract these rules because we'll probably want to use max length somewhere else as well. So we might as well abstract them all. So to do that, we will go ahead and I don't know what the custom is in Viewland. Uh, where I'm used to, we have a utils folder that has stuff like this. And we'll go ahead and create a validations.js file. And so that is going to hold all of our validations that we create. Then uh, we're going to export all of these. So we're going to export required, min length, and max length. And we'll make sure we have to define them properly. All right, so now it's properly defined as a function. Let's do that for the others. Then let's make our video edit form work again. So we're going to have to import our validations from utils slash validations. And I think we need a slash here as well. And then we can splat them into our data. Let's go ahead and check and make sure that works. So we will edit one of these. And we've got an error. Uh, so it says property method required is not defined on the instance. Let's go ahead and so we're importing it properly. And our export, uh, we do not have our default export. OK, that should work. Excellent. And you can see we have the counters. If we go below 5, it will turn red and make the button go gray. So all right, our validations are still working. We've abstracted them correctly. Now let's use them in our user login. So we'll import the validations from the same place. And then we'll go ahead and put them in our data as well. And now we can use them. So we'll start with the text field. Uh, the email. So our first rule is going to be required. All right, let's check to see if that's working. We will go to our login page. And all right, excellent. So that works. And we're going to be wanting to put in a email format rule here. But first, let's go ahead and use the ones that we already have. So here, uh, we're going to have required as well. And we're also going to have a min length. And that is going to be 8. All right, fantastic. Let's go ahead and test that out. Good. And we can go ahead and throw a counter on there as well, just so they know how many use, uh, letters they've typed. All right, excellent. Now let's go ahead and attach the validness of this form. 
and tie it to the button. So we're gonna make it disabled if it's not valid. And we can see that it is properly disabled until all the validations pass. Now let's add another rule and we'll make this one email format. And there'll be no arguments. It'll just be checking the format of this email to make sure it's at least structurally valid. All right, so we'll go to our validations page and we will create the email format function. And it takes in nothing. And all right, so first let's create our regex. I went ahead and pasted that in. You don't have to understand that. That just checks whether it's an email. Now we can return a function like we do in the other validations. So we'll check if V is there. And if it is, then we'll use regex.test on it. And so V, remember, is the string that is passed in. All right, and so if it passes this test, then it passes the validation. Otherwise, we'll give an error. Then we'll add this to our export and we'll check to see if it works. Uh, we're already using it here. So we'll go here. All right. Perfect. Our validation is working. So now we have a presentable login. It's not perfect, but uh, it does everything it's supposed to and it has some nice user conveniences. Next, we'll be tackling registration and creating new users through that form. Our register user screen is gonna be a lot like our user login screen. So much so, in fact, that a good starting point would be just copying and pasting the entire thing. However, there's a smarter way to do that. And that, of course, is a component. So we're going to be creating a user auth form component. And so what we'll be doing is instead of copying and pasting it into the user registration, we will cut this and put it in here. And then we will make sure the name is correct and the spacing is correct. Now our first step when abstracting something is to make sure that it works with the place it was previously. So we'll make sure that the user auth form works correctly in the user login. So we will import the user auth form from components, user auth form, then stick that in a components hash. And then finally, we'll get to use it in our template. Now we need to decide what to pass down and what to take away and put into the form itself. So let's look at our data first. Show password is local to the form. We don't need to use it outside the form. So that should go in there. Same thing with our validations. And login info, uh, that's the same as well. We don't need to access our login info outside the form unless we are calling to uh, use it in the store. But I still think we should put it in the form. So let's go ahead and cut all this data and put it in here. And we'll go ahead and get the validations import as well. Now this login user method I think should stay out here and we'll pass it in. We'll call it submit form because that's nice and generic for both the 
user login, and the user registration. But now we have a problem. Uh, this dot login info is no longer in this component. It's in this component. So what we'll have to do is take it as an argument. And there we go. That is step one to solving our issue. And step two, so we have to rename this to submit form. And then we have to pass in our login info. And now this form should work again. Let's give it a try. First, we'll test out the validations. Uh, they seem to be working. Then we'll put in nonsense stuff and make sure we can get the error. And so we do have an error, just not the type that I wanted. So it says submit form is not a function. And the issue here is that I forgot to specify the props. So now our component is expecting submit form to be passed in. And let's see it working now. All right, so we've got it all hooked up. Now let's test how it does with something that's a correct email and login. All right, excellent. It still works. Now that we've abstracted this, we can use this for our user registration as well as our user login. Actually, first let's go ahead and make stuff a little bit more generic. So we'll have button text instead of login. And that means we need to pass in button text as a prop and button text here will be equal to login. And then we'll go ahead and call this user info instead of login info because it's always user info, even if it's registration, but it's only login info in the login. All right, now we are ready to make this into a user registration form. As usual, this journey will start in our router file. And so we will, instead of user login, we'll have our user registration. And we will create that component. And notice because of our naming, we, had, we started them both with user, so they are right next to each other in the folder. That's nice. And that was definitely done on purpose. And it's part of what's recommended in the uh, Vue.js style guide. All right, so our first thing will be to import our user auth form because that will be the core of what we're doing here. And then our components will have the user auth form and we'll use the user auth form here. And we have two arguments so far. One is submit form and we'll need a method for that. And the other is button text, and we'll call this uh, register. All right, let's get a method for that submit form, and we will call it register user. That should be enough to get started on this page. So. Let's go ahead and check it out. All right, so we once again have basically the exact same form that we had before, except now it says register. And we'll go ahead and wrap it in a V container so that it looks a little bit better. Now, if we check this out, the email validation still works. The password validation still works, and we can click this, and well, it doesn't do anything yet, but 
all the stuff within the form still works. This was a good abstraction. But we do notice something. So when we log in, up here, there's going to be the uh, username. Except uh, right now, there is not the username. We don't have one. So we need to ask the user for their name. But we don't want that in the login form. So how can we make that work? The answer is surprisingly easy. So we will put in a has name property, set it to true here, and then we will say that we are accepting that. And then we'll add another text field here. And in this text field, we'll remove the email format, make this name, connect it to userinfo.name. And then this is the new part. We will use a v if on it. So if has name, then it'll ask for the name. So let's go ahead and see this. There it is, asking for the name in registration and not asking for the name in the login. And there's something really cool about this. So check out uh, here, you have to input a name. The register button does not let you click it, even though the email and the password are fine. Now, if we go to the login, you may think, uh-oh, there's no way to fill out the name, so we're never going to be able to log in. But it turns out that that VF also takes care of those rules. So if it's the field is not displaying, the rules don't apply to that form. Our form is displaying correctly, so now we need to make it actually work. So we'll get in the registration info, and we'll be receiving that from when we call submit form. And then for this, it's going to be remarkably similar to login user. So we'll go ahead and copy it and change what we need. It's not similar enough that we can abstract it, though. So we'll dispatch to a register user and get the registration info. And then we'll get back the user. If there's an error, then we will alert the user. And if it succeeds, then we will say, uh, instead of thank you for signing in, we'll say, welcome to our app, user.name. And of course, we need to make this async because we use await here. Now let's go ahead and look at our store and make uh, register user work. So have register user and it will take in a commit and registration info. And this form will also be similar to the login user. So we'll have a try and then we'll call out to something. In this case, we'll call out to users, which will make a create call. And then we'll get the registration info. We'll feed that in and we'll have the response. The response will also have a user and we will set the current user to that user. So this part of it is almost the same except for the information we feed it and where we send the data. So instead of sessions, it's users. And of course, your API could be done differently. This is just a uh, somewhat typical RESTful API. Then our error, uh, we don't know what errors there could be. One possible one is that the uh, email has already been in use, but we're not sure. So let's just say there was an error. Please try again. Uh, fairly generic. And then when we fix this one in a much later video to be more specific, we can also fix this one. Now let's test out this form. All right, fantastic. We get this alert and we are automatically logged in. 
So we've got our login screen, we've got our registration screen, they're both working. Before we move on, there is something else we need to do. Actually several, but we'll start with the most important one. So notice I uh, refresh the page and somewhere along the way, our automatic login got broken. Or did it? So something interesting, if we go to admin slash users, now suddenly we're automatically logged in. So what's happening? The issue is that, so we call load users when the admin user list component is mounted. And we, for convenience, added this to load users, when in reality, we need a second one that says load current user. And if we then separate out these two lines, then we'll be able to call load current user on every single page. And so let's go to app.view and right after load videos, we will load current user. Then if we go back to this page and refresh, we'll automatically see this in the top right. The second thing is actually really easy, but also very important. So this login button uh, doesn't do a thing. So let's go ahead and fix that and add a register button. So we'll go to our app.view and here we'll go ahead and combine this V button and this span because we don't really need both. And we will give this a two and it'll go to login and so it doesn't actually need to be dynamic. And then we will copy and paste that and change this to register or registration for the path. And now they work. Also in the interest of keeping things user-friendly, let's go ahead and give a title for each page because Right now, you just kind of have to look at the URL and know what's happening. Ah, it's a little bit better. Okay, so that was a lot. Thank you so much for sticking with me. And I hope you learned a lot and are able to implement your own authentication systems. But here's the thing, we're not done. We are not even done with building complete system. So. Uh, if you've done one of these before, you may notice the lack of token authentication, which we'll be tackling in the next video, as well as authorization, telling users which resources and pages they can access. And we'll be tackling that in the next video as well. But for now, let's review. So we created two new routes, the user login and user registration. And we linked to those from our uh, nav bar. And so in our nav bar, if our current user is signed in, we display the name of the current user. And then we have our logout button, which goes to the logout action, which dispatches to the store and then eventually calls logout user, which sets our current user state to this empty hash and our local storage to that empty hash as well. Then uh, if the user is not logged in, we have links to our login and our register pages. And we have our nice VIF and VLS in charge of that. When we start up, we call load videos and load current user. And load current user takes uh, our current user in the local storage and sets it as the current user. So here's our load current user. It parses what's in the local storage and commits our set current user mutation. What all this means is that if you've logged in and you have not yet logged out, then whether you refresh the page or visit it in a different, uh, at a different time after closing it down, then you'll still be logged in. Now we'll look at how that logging in actually happens. 
Our user login view is fairly simple because we've delegated most of it to the user auth form component. So we'll start there. So the user auth form, it has a blank user info hash to start with. And so the user info uh, hash is fed into these text fields. And then once you hit submit form, it takes that user info and uh, feeds it into the submit form action uh, well method. And so that submit form method is defined on user login. And here it's our login user method. So here we take in the login info and we dispatch out to our login user action. And we wait for that to come back and then we either alert an error or alert a thank you for signing in. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at that action. So our login user here is, uh, we wrap all of it in a try block. And if it fails at any time, it'll return this hash with an error. But assuming it goes well, we call out to the API. Uh, we post to sessions our login info. So this will be an email and a password. And we'll get a response. We will, uh, because it's JSON API, dot data, dot data, dot attributes to get the user. And then we commit set current user. And once again, the set current user uh, sets the current user in both the store state and in local storage. That's the basics of our user login. There's also some extra bells and whistles we added to the user auth form. So we added validations. Uh, we have these rules applied to the various text fields, and these rules are now in their own utils file. And so we define them and then export them, and then we splat them into the data so they can be used here. Anyways, if all of these are valid, then this will turn valid and we'll be able to click the button to log in or register. We also had a special feature where we could make the password visible or invisible by clicking a button. How we did that was using a Vutify feature specifically meant for something like this. And we had our show password variable, which was by default false. And then, uh, so that changes the type, which is either text if we want to show it or password if we want it to be dots. And then it appends the icon, either an eye or an eye off. And then we have click colon append, which will uh, run this whenever you click the icon that's been appended. Finally, we have user registration. And so this has a lot of similarities to user login, which was why we uh, abstracted a lot of this into the user auth form component. But there are a couple things that are different. So first we have has name equals true. And so if we go to our user auth form, we'll notice that this text field has a vif. And so it's only displayed if has name is equal to true. So it's displayed in registration, not displayed in login. And you'll notice that it does have a validation rule. But if this text field is not displayed, then this validation rule does not apply to the entire form. So in the login, where this is not displayed, you can still click this button, even though the name has not been filled out. The other big difference with registering user, so we're dispatching to register user, and it's actually, honestly, not that different here. So you'll see that aside from where it posts and the error message, they are almost the same. The big difference is on the server side. 
And of course, everyone uses a different server-side framework, so we can't get into too many details about that. However, I can say what's expected. So in when we're posting to users, it expects name and email and password. And then what we get back is either a user or we get an error. Meanwhile, with our login user, we expect to send an email and a password, and then we get back either a user that has already been created, or we get back a 401 unauthorized. And of course, on the server, the login user, the post to sessions, is finding a user that already exists, whereas posting to users is creating a new user using the registration info. And that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe, and that way you'll get notified when the next video comes out, when we complete our user authentication system. I'll see you then.